Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here at the New Art School and Design the Ducks podcast. Our guest today is Jago Bloom. Welcome, Jago. Hi, Lev Teres. Lovely to be invited. Great to have you here. Great to have you. So tell us a bit about you and your work. Well, at the moment, I'm, um, I work for the British School of Creative Arts in Sao Paulo. Um, our school's the second educational venture that our school founder, Alex Avramov, has created. Um, the first being the British School of Design in Moscow. I'm responsible for developing and programming the BA British Design programs of BA Graphic Design and BA Illustration, which is overseen by Hertfordshire University in the UK. Um, the school's been running for three years now, and I've been in the role since its inception. From day one, it was aware that we were doing something completely different um, with our decision to bring the UK education to the Latin Americas. Uh, it really does feel like we're changing the landscape of Bra Brazilian education. We're the first of our kind to, to bring this type of education to Sao Paulo. And um, it's, it's, been, it's been a... It's been a, an experience of understanding what I can provide and where I need to be flexible as well. So it's been a challenge in learning how to be flexible in practice of education. Yeah. Mm. So what, what is Brazilian education like? What, what is the contrast between your paradigm and the existing paradigm? It, it's, it's really very interesting. So um, um, I've been here for three years and I've, I've noticed a, a different way that students are educated. You've got to understand that democracy is still very young in a place like Brazil. Um, and challenge is not awarded in education, in the current education systems. Um, what is awarded is doing things that are right and doing things that are wrong and being learned by technique. So our students who come into this very very student-centered practice of UK design education. Um, they're introduced to something completely foreign to themselves, you know? Um, and it's really exciting to see those students who engage with it um, and, and find their way through becoming these, these independent, self, self sort of creating uh, designers and artists. Um, but it's a challenge for a lot of them as well. Because, um, because they have to find that inner voice and they have to learn to be able to take those risks um, and they have to realize that, um, that they, they have the freedom to be able to do that. All of these things that we take for granted, lefters, um, as students within the UK, um, which provide us with real riches of understanding and learning, um, not only about our practices, but about ourselves, through the system of education um, is something entirely new to the students here as well. They're all incredibly creative, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I've, I've never seen such a creative bunch, actually, in all of my time of teaching. Um, from day one, from year one, their, their creativity and their approach to creativity was head and shoulders above the rest. But that side of businessification, you know, the ability to understand what to do with or where to go next with their creativity, completely missing, you know. Um, and that's a lot down to how the society or how the government respects or presents the world of the creative, the creative economy. Um, and at the moment, um, as I was saying, that schools don't award that kind of challenge or that kind of free thought or free practice of creativity that we're used to seeing in places like the UK and across Europe. Um, here in Brazil, arts and creativity and craft is still part of the street. It's still pushed to the peripheries. They call it the peripheries, you know, um, the frontier, the border. So, um, so arts is still part of the border. And what we're living within, as you've probably seen in the politics that you see on a weekly, um, is, is living in a world of the constructed image, you know, is, which is a world which is guided by the media, which reassures the masses, you know, but that world of art, of music, of design, of those people who can really make a change, 
um, it, it's difficult for them. You know, they don't have the freedom and they don't have the resources to be able to get those those voices out there like they do across Europe. Mm. So from my year one, we're making these young designers, um, these young world change makers who are realizing the tools that they've got and the power that they have within within their creativity. And, and we're, we're getting them into the right mindset to hopefully make a change with all of this. So that's what I talk about when I say changing the landscape for Brazilian education. Yeah. I know it's ambitious, you know, but I've always been ambitious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, we have to bring the, the, the periphery, uh, preserve uh, the periphery, because exactly. art and design has always been, uh, in, in a way, uh, there. yeah. And 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 you're absolutely right, Left Terrace. And some would say that part of art or part of design needs to stay in the periphery, doesn't it? You know, um, for it to for it to have a use, you know. And maybe that comes back to my um, my old utilitarian ways of design, yeah. um, because I come from a fine art practice, from the tradition of design and art. Um, from the school of from the school of art in Glasgow, Glasgow oh. School of Art. So that was about the applied art of design. That's how we got taught design, you know. Um, and from that, I followed a trajectory of masters of fine art and a masters of electronic imagery. Um, always interrogated the media, always interrogating the medium, but always had some appreciation to the concept of utilitarian, of something having a use. You know, um, there's a wonderful there's a wonderful interview by the, um, the great slogan master Milton Glaser. You know, the wonderful New York designer on YouTube, where he's talking about seeing his art in a gallery in New York. You know, and something in, unsettles him when he sees his art, when he sees his design, or his creativity in a in an art gallery. Um, it would unsettle him. And what he wanted to see was it down on the street, you know? He wanted to be able to walk along the street and he wanted to be able to see his work on the street. And when he saw his work on the streets, um, he would have a reassurance. It would resonate with him, you know, because he would realize that his work would have an impact. His creative works have an impact on the lives of, of the communities within which he or we live within, you know? Um, and that's something that I feel like I've sort of taken with my practice as well. Mm. Tell us about your journey into teaching. Yeah, so so from 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 the a sort of practice of um, from my practice of BA design at Glasgow School of Art, straight out of school into Scotland. Fortunate to land some very exciting live projects and commissions as soon as I left, which gave me the opportunity to travel internationally, funded by the likes of the British Council and the Arts Council and Media Scotland, um, to places like Russia and Finland and um, Croatia and Colombia, all projects having some elements of collaboration and all grounded in social design and interaction. Um, and this was at a time when I didn't have names or titles for that kind of practice. Um, projects that would always encourage um, the development of some kind of workshop alongside the practices um, as a way of sharing skills and exchanging knowledge with indigenous communities. Um, one in particular was um, in the community, Comuna Trezi in Bogota. Uh, no, in Medellin, actually, for Pixelazo, which are a network in Finland. Um, Pixelazo had networks in Dakar, in Mumbai, in Colombia. They had, a, and it was all about bringing the sort of Western, um, the Westernized sort of understanding of electronics and merging of DIY culture um, to these indigenous communities and sharing that kind of practice. Um, Commune Trezi in the 1990s was the place where the Black Hawks went in and, and blowed up the entire community because of the guerrillas, you know. Um, we were fortunate enough to be in there and we were fortunate enough to create this sort of activities and practices based around live events, based around workshops, 
based around the idea of sharing knowledge. Um, artists from, from international artists and many from Europe coming together. Um, for, the, for the communities, for the children, for the mothers, I created a set of MIDI maracas. Um, I picked up some maracas on my road trip. I took film through the road trip and in some way hacked the maracas so that as they were played, they would broadcast 8-bit sounds and looped video images from my road trip journey. I didn't know how to play it, you know, but I made this tool and in the middle of the festival gave them to the kids and they took control of the sounds and the visuals on the screen, you know. Um, here's something that they all know so well, you know, they all know the instruments, the maracas, um, but fused with a Western sensibility and with an unfamiliar result, you know, and this is what's exciting. When we take something that's, that's familiar and we change its use is something which I'm really fascinated with. One of, the, one of the young kids, I'd love to know what he's doing now, DJ Dax, I remember his name. Um, he loved it, he wouldn't let go, you know, and he came back day after day. And one day he came back with a letter and I still have the letter in my studio. And it's a letter written by his English teacher. And he gave me it with a tear in his eye. And he said, you teach us not to pick up guns, but to click a mix. And what he's saying with click a mix is to do something in the moment, do something creative, you know? So these sort of, and every festival that I was involved with had moments like this, in, you know, rising out of those early sort of 2000s moments when practice was still sort of emerging through that interaction and technological and hacking sort of phase that design went through. Um, so from that, I naturally sort of fell into teaching as being central to my, to a central component of my creative practice. Um, I moved to London around 2010 for a few creative partnerships with the music industry, um, one being doing the tour visuals for Franz Ferdinand, and then that moved into other visual sort of ex visual experiences and collaborations with um, a techno artist as well in a band called Planetary Assault Systems. Um, when I moved to London, I attended a number of design networks. Um, London has this wonderful richness of enthusiasm of people who want to get together, and people who want to talk about things, you know? Um, and I connected with articulate and inspiring program leaders, you know, um, people who realized the fundamental qualities of design, you know, and the impact that it has on the ground. And through those networks, I connected with wonderful creative agencies, directors, you know, who also brought education to the foreground and to the front of all of their practice. One of the, um, one of the networks was, one of the conferences was called Alt Shift in 2012, and it went on for a few years um, through, through where I met my first articulate, very, very inspiring program leader, um, which took me to my world of, of lectureship for communication design in Norwich University of the Arts. Um, Alt Shift was run by a... a wonderful program leader called Derek Yates, who's now working for Ravensbourne. Um, and he, and, and I followed the practice and, and that practice took me to working with Derek at Winchester School of Art as well. So I've allowed my practice of design to take me where I feel I'm gonna get the most from the peers that I'm working around as well. Those people have the ambition um, to make changes, you know, and those people who can see the change it can be done um, if you're willing to put in put in the time and put in the efforts, which I think I, I think we all have to do as design lecturers. You know, um, our time is is always going to be is always going to be needed by the students. Our time is always taken, but we need to find the time to to create wonderful activities and moments that bring our students out of the studios and connect them with these with external partner projects, you know, and give them that feel of um, what design really is about, which isn't about the craft or the making per se, 
although we do need to find a way of articulating, expressing ourselves um, in a way that can connect, you know, in a way that can be understood. But also we might want to be able to disrupt it and we might want to be able to rethink it, you know. And for that, we need to get in with those people, those audiences, those communities um, that, we, that we feel connected to. Ultimately, design's about making connections then, really, isn't it? You know, and it's about, it's about finding those connections um, or it's about finding your own voice. Before you think about the opinions of others, find your own voice, you know, and then, and then bring that together with the opinions of others. I think Paula Scher says something and she puts it very simple. She says, um, I know it's a big generalization, left areas, but I like to use these things in the department. Um, she says that fine art is very personal and design is social, you know? And I think from that sort of a perspective and putting it in such sort of opposites like that, students can sort of think about it, you know, and understand where they are situating themselves within that practice. Um, I, know it's a, I know that there are people from all camps who move within that space, but I do think there is something to be said about the social side of design. Um, there was a wonderful, there was a wonderful exhibition by David Hockney recently, and I remember a Guardian article, and on the front page, David Hockney, one of my heroes, you know, said, I did it all myself, you know, in his true Sheffield voice. Um, which is, which, which he did, but he didn't, he did, but he didn't, you know? Um, and I think that's something that differentiates the world of design from art, you know? Is, of course, he did it all himself, but he did have his workers, you know? He did have people who supported him to create this wonderful exhibition, you know? And that thing about the artist um, being in front of the work, you know? And that thing about designers doing it with others, and in some sense, being part of a team, you know, where we work together, um, which is very democratic and very social, you know. And, and, I'm, and I'm always, I'm, I'm enamored to that kind of a practice. Um, so kind of fallen into the world of design through my own ideologies like that. That's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, so how do you... Uh, bring all this to education and sort of uh, how do you work with the current state of education uh, with all of these uh, ideas? Yeah. Um, I, I am sure that we have, I'm sure that we bring in a lot of externally partnered projects, Left Eris, you know. Um, I believe, I believe in those initial provocations that I heard in the design networks um, from the early festivals that I go to and now through the networks that I still I still attend when I can in the UK like GLAD or GDEN um, run by people like James Carazio and these wonderful art lecturer design lecturer sort of provocators who 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 are keeping up with the moment you know who who, who understand that design is about being present, I think, you know, um, which we would call the zeitgeist, wouldn't it, really? You know, which is sort of staying in this moment of present and understanding what we need now and how we can bring that into the world of teaching. Um, for me, that's about working, working and understanding and learning with an industry and not from an industry. So it's about, in any way, bringing that industry into the department and ensuring that they're part of the conversation and ensuring that we're not trying to second guess what the industry is or how our students should be. Um, because in effect, the industry is constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, it's constantly growing. Um, and for us to, to feel like, the, to second guess that would put our students at a disadvantage. So finding in any opportunity ways that we can bring those students and those partners together, finding any opportunity that we can allow our students to take those risks that they need to take, um, which is something that, as I was speaking about, is something that in Brazil is a real challenge, but something that a lot of them get. Um, 
which takes the practice of design into the world of visual communication, which takes the practice of thinking out into the streets and turns it into action, you know? Um, I think there's a big difference between the world of reflection and the world of action. I think our students need to understand where they're positioning themselves and where they where their practice is at its most benefit. And that is in the world of action. And action is out on the streets, you know? And I think that's what's brought me to a place like Brazil to, to take on this challenge is um, if ever there is, if ever there is a place where, is, there is, where design is needed, um, it's a place where there's problems. And, um, and this, 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 country that I find myself in has a lot of them, which means that which means that there's an opportunity there for us to do something good about it, you know. Um, so making our students aware of that as well, making them understand those the social implications of, of design, um, making them wield it like a big fuck off bat with spikes on it, as James Victoria talks about um, graphic design. Um, in, in a space of experimentation and freedom. So in the design studios, we, we cultivate that space of experimentation and freedom. I think it's important that we keep an eye on their career prospects. I think it's important that we understand that there is, yes, a progression that we need to, that we need to ensure that they're working towards. But we also need to carve out a space that designers, young designers, and creators can feel free from those, those, um, those, those, and um, those anxieties uh, that might limit the, the creativity that they can actually create, um, and the opportunities that can come from from practice that is based on process and inquiry, and not through some object-driven origin or some predetermined outcome. Um, yeah, and we, and we do that in so many wonderful ways. You know, I've started getting very specific with our project tasks now, you know. Um, working on accesses, giving them accesses to, to sort of break down, um, break down the way that they approach a task. For example, we might take a, um, we might take a subject such as um, cultural representation. And then we might break it down into four axes, and one of the axes might be um, an access of um, normality, or an access of um, rebellion, or an access of tolerance, or an access of empathy. So, sort of giving our students tools to allow them to engage with subjects in a way that takes it away from their own persona, their own personality, their own choices, their own options. Um, and we're getting a lot of results out of this. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Fascinating to work with the students of today. I tell you, Lefteris, you know. Um, there are a lot of students here. It's a private school, you know, which, which makes things different. Um, there are a lot of students that don't have issues, or they don't have the issues that we feel that we're looking at, that they feel are important, you know, um, but they do have ethics, you know, and they say, and when we talk about issues with them, some of the students say, um, they, they say, how can I take on an issue that isn't my own without being false, you know? Um, Therefore, without being false, I want to be true. So I won't take on any issue and I'll try to still create a practice. Now that takes us into the world of this new generation of norm core, you know, or this world of, and we would call it the new normal before the papers have taken it on board um, for this sort of COVID crisis, you know, um, that sort of new normal, which is this world of blankness, um, that a lot of the young generation are facing now, or young generation coming out of the sort of middle classes, um, which are students which don't have issues, but um, are being faced with tasks and projects that are encouraging them to deal with issues, 
but they want to be real within all of this. Um, and they're finding really interesting ways to come up with their own issues so that they can feel like they have a, a relationship to that. Um, and, and it's fascinating to see. It's something that's emerging um, out, out of this culture, actually, are, are those types of students who are looking at the normalcy of their lives, you know, um, rather than taking or upholding issues that, that are separate to their, their own lives. I'm sorry, I sound like I've sort of gone on a little bit in that, but um, this is what's happening in the uh, on the, in the studio floors. We need you to express your, your ideas. They're, they're very interesting. Um, so do you find that there are any limitations to the current education structures? Uh, are they allowing you to fully express what you want, or would you uh, replace, remove, or create new structures? Um, that's an interesting subject, and... Uh, the, it's a interest, It's a subject that that I've been speaking about with with our wonderful external examiner, Dr. Simon Bell, um, who comes over a couple of times a year to assess the program. and 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 what it makes me think of, Lefteris, is is that balance between expansion and consolidation. You know. Um, all of, all of the skills that I look towards as models of good practice have consolidated what they're doing in some way. Um, and in the current climate and under, our, under the practice of education, we're seeing a lot of schools now that are facing difficulties um, because of this transition into blended learning or because of perhaps they've, they've expanded to a point where they are reliant on external factors um, too much, which are now causing problems, particularly in, in um, the UK. I, I'm well aware of the um, situation that schools are now facing because of the pandemic with international students for the new semesters, you know. Um, and it works in many different sort of guises in different institutes. The schools that have it right are the schools that have consolidated their practice, are the schools that have the support to be able to create wonderful programs um, with limited numbers of students, you know, and in some way find a way of supporting that ecology of practice. Um, I'm very fortunate at the moment because we have small numbers as well, you know. Our, stu our school uh, has, has a limited number of students which means that we can, we can create wonderful practice with them, you know, um, which means that they get a lot out of us as well, which means that those discussions become a lot more central to the practice that is being played out in the studios and the relationships that are being played out within the industry and our, 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 the ecology that supports our department. Um, so, yeah, so for me, I, I believe it's about, it's about, looking inwards and looking at those crutches that we use as institutes um, that are causing problems or that could cause problems if they were taken away. And um, finding ways of opening up those discussions um, with, with the educational boards or with the governments to be able to ensure that we can create these schools that aren't as reliant on the numbers that, that we're used to or the numbers that have been steadily increasing in the schools, in particularly in the UK, over the past 18, 20 years. Um, bringing it back down to that world of, of quality practice or that or, or what we're all what we're all aiming for and which all schools are asking us to provide, you know, this quality practice that, um, that and learning, you know, which is very individual to students and and the experience that those students will take away from them after that as well absolutely so have mm. you how have you handled the the, the, the recent challenges of uh, the distance uh, teaching yeah um it's wonderful left that is um, my my department is a gift my my staff team are a gift you know um i think there's something about the brazilian culture if you've ever watched Brazilian football, okay, um, they're up for a challenge, you know? They're up for change. They like change, you know? 
And if that change is a challenge, they, they really like that as well. That's, that's twice the bonus for them. So I've asked them to change. I've asked them to be flexible. And, um, and, and it's been a challenge. But they've taken to it 100% because, because this, is, this is what they're here for. You know, this is what makes them move, is that ability to be flexible, is that ability to change at a given notice. Um, something in the psyche, something in the mindset, you know, um, the sort of flexibility of culture over here as well is, is all a part of that. So my team have adapted and, and we have three year groups and I have different pathways and each pathway has responded individually to its own group of students. So each pathway, um, is working differently and we found wonderful ways of working and they're, and they're all working different models um, I have the freedom to be able to make that happen left there so I have the freedom to be able to oversee this and because there's no there's no fear of a shared practice as well you know and there's a complete openness to the practice that we're doing um, and that's and that's from the ground up so in the studios it's open studios open walls open collab you know, and into the staff department where we're open with our practice. So weekly we, we meet and we discuss and we share our practice. I think this is again one of those one of those strengths of these small of small programs, consolidated practice, you know. I have a team of around 10 staff, you know, that um and full-time staff. And um and they all started around the same time and we're all new. And we're all creating this together. So there's, there's a real energy of an open practice there. So we share that practice and, and we all refine our own programs to ensure that we're all learning and responding to the practice that the others uh, uh, have found worked, you know. Um, and the students are very happy with it. So it's, it's all happening. It's all happening wonderfully. Exhausting, but wonderful. So how have you handled the distance? Is, is, there, is there some... On, uh, Physical learning happenings now? Or? This is, yeah, that's a good point to, to raise as well, actually. Um, blended learning is the key. Yeah. But blended learning can only happen if our students have the resources, yes. you know. Um, and this is why, um, this is why we're going to be facing some issues in the world of education if we don't if we don't if we don't realize this if we don't recognize it you know yeah. if we don't reset a balance somehow because those stu those students from those marginalized communities over here from the estates from the, from 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 the from the peripheries they don't have the resources they don't have the computers you know we don't have what the western world has to support our practice yeah. um we have we have passion, inspiration, creativity. We have the sun, the light, you know, the space, the brutalist architecture, but we don't have the resources, you know. Um, some of our students do, some of our students don't. Um, you'll be fa your students in the UK will be facing it as well. But I feel like universities in the UK are in a better position to be able to support and provide those resources um, think about it this way, Left Eris. An Apple Mac computer over here is still 40% more expensive than it is in the UK, you know? So, that, so from those embargoes on the United States and Brazil from the, from the late 1980s, there's still this sort of, there's still this separation, there's still this class division in that, um, in that things are expensive, so you've got to be rich to be able to afford them. Um, which means that those that aren't rich can't afford them. So there's still this stratification of, of class um, that does create a problem. Um, so, so we're working with it in ways that we can, you know, mm. and, and our students are very adaptable as well with us and very understanding. Sure. So we're doing what we can. But if we were to move to a plan like this full time, that blended that blend is the key is really important that we ensure that our students are in some way supported by those that technology those resources physical, physical activities as well physical activities we've been we've been doing a lot of um 
live Instagram lives with our students sure. as well, you know. They've been asking for things, finding ways that we can, finding ways of adapting tools and and objects and elements from around our homes, you know, and, and finding ways of, of doing low cost, um, low cost of prototypes and testing really. And that's what, the, a lot of that is what we'll be, we'll be assessing, assessing this semester, we've told our students. We're looking for the prototypes, we're looking for the low tech solutions, you know. Um, we're looking at your ability to articulate your wonderful ideas um, and, and we're not, we're not necessarily going to be concerned about the quality or the finish mm -hmm. of practice for this semester. Sure. So from day one, we've been, we've been working throughout as if it was a, a semester, really. This, we, we didn't stop. But where do you see uh, physical activity in all this? When do you, how do you see physical activity in all this? Like, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a real problem, isn't it? Because... Um, my my critical and cultural studies um, instructor Kadu, um, we have conversations about this. He's integral to the program. Um, I've, we've created a wonderful program with critical and contextual studies central to all of this practice. You know, he's seen a raise in all of the practice of the students. You know, um, they've moved into that CNCS area of thinking about design really well because. Because you can think about things in isolation, can't you? You know, it's it's easy for us to get reflective, and this is the dangers that I discuss with my students in the department. The danger of moving into that world of reflection and out of that world of action, you know. And we constantly need to be getting our students into that world of action, um, for them to be those those true communicators. Um, and this is a real danger, you know. And um, and. It's provocative because it means, for me, I can imagine many vice chancellors rubbing their hands, <laughs> thinking about which programs they can they can dismiss over the next couple of years because of this. You know, I think there's going to be conversations that we need um, in order to be able to support those programs that are physically demanding and resource reliant, because. Um, it's so integral to the practice and it always will be if we want doers and beers and not thinkers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, where can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, yeah, they can, they can, I've, I've put a few links on my LinkedIn. Actually, it would be lovely to connect with a few of the, um, the listeners and other academics who are watching this program on LinkedIn um, which will take you to my my portfolio of creative practice, which which is which is deeply embedded within social space, di um, digital public space, um, real time graphical processes for the musical industry, um, which is my website Gabba TV, um, on the Instagram as well through Graphic Human, which I'll give you the link to Left Eris. And we have an Instagram for the school as well, which is eBack, which is the name of the school. Mm -hmm. So I'll provide you with these links. Um, it would be wonderful to, yes, if any, if there are any listeners who would be interested in making any sort of partnerships or thinking about practice of overseas overseas partnerships, let's do it. You know, let's bring yeah, our students yeah, together to participate in our uh, conference in Valencia uh, this, this November. So it would be lovely. So we'll organize something in that. Yeah. Any, any last piece of advice? Um, stay safe. <laughs> yeah, stay safe. Um, yeah. No, I'm, that's fine. It was wonderful to do this, Left Eris. Thank yes. you for providing me with the opportunity. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, good. Okay. Soon, all the best. Speak to you again.